This is the very special Richard and Judy book club, exclusive to WH Smith. And if you're in the mood for more, check out the bonus content just for you at richardandjudy.whsmith.co.uk. Hmm. No, not that one. Done that. Done that. Ooh, <laughs> no one should ever do that. Too easy, too dull, too safe. Done that, Ashtanga and Bikram. Come on, Judy, you need to pick another one. We both agreed that this year we'd learn new skills. I'm rattling along with my throat singing, and you've only done the skydiving, and you got to grips with a, a couple of obscure musical instruments. I'm still waiting to hear you sing to me. And anyway, what about that desert ultramarathon you were planning? Oh, well, come on, come on. Who knew I'd be that allergic to sand? Oh, it's too hard to choose. I can't think. You do it. OK, then. Eeny, meeny, miny... Richard, the book club, exclusive to WH Smith. I'll get the kettle on, you get the book. MJ Arledge, Eeny, meeny. Hi, welcome to the next instalment of our uh, summer book club with WH Smith. And uh, the next book that we're going to be talking about is a debut novel, actually. It's a first novel for this young man. And I say young man because I thought he was a woman. <laughs> He wrong-footed me completely. He's MJ Arledge. M actually stands for Matt. But by putting his initials and by the fact that his heroine in the book, um, Detective Helen Grace, uh, is a woman, obviously, I kind of thought he must be a woman. Um, because, because, he he writes, so convincingly. because he writes so convincingly mm. about a woman and a woman's psyche. But he's not. So congratulations, Matt. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you, just, just just before we move on to the actual book, I mean, did you decide to use your initials for a reason rather than your name? Yes, it was, that was very deliberate. It was basically on advice from my agent, who when she sent it out to all the publishers, basically said, use your initials because most of the people reading this will be women. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so don't give away that you're a man because yeah. some of them possibly might subconsciously think, ah, oh, you know, he thinks he knows how to write yeah. a woman, does well, he? Well, con congratulate your agent. She got it absolutely right. Um, and I definitely did think that she was a woman. Well, anyway, well, the I, book I, is I, called just hang, just hang on a second. I'll just, <laughs> I'll just quote from, because we write the reviews for these books once we've read them and then we pick them for the club. And uh, this is the last paragraph of Judy's half of her review for Eeny Meeny. We don't know if the author is a man or a woman. Initials are a common writer's ruse, but I suspect she's female. Surely she couldn't know Helen Grace so intimately without sharing her gender. So this, this is for real. You really did think, and I did too. Yeah. Well, look, Matt, uh, uh, Eeny Meeny, uh, it's, as I say, a debut novel, though you have worked in television production um, for dramas and things for, for a very yeah. long time. And it's actually, it's a terrific story. It's fantastically uh, a fantastically gripping thriller. It's very full on, and maybe that should have been my clue that you were actually a man, <laughs> because you write about violence unflinchingly. But just, can you sum it up for us first? <clears throat> um, so Eeny Meeny is a thriller about a serial killer who abducts people in pairs. So it could be a mother and daughter, boyfriend, girlfriend, just two work colleagues. And when they come to, they find themselves in a locked room with a gun, which has one bullet inside it. And the killer tells them that one of them will have to kill the other one in order to survive and be released. And it's up to them which one lives and which one dies. And actually, not only have they been left with the gun, that's the only thing they've been left with. They have no food, yeah. they have no water, yeah. they have no light. Uh, they are reduced over several days to the most desperate circumstances. Well, animalistic, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, absolutely, that's it. So, because I think most people would, uh, given that sort of ultimatum, would obviously refuse. So, you know, the serial killer pushes them to the brink by starving them, essentially. And it's at that point where they're absolutely desperate, when they're losing their mind, that one of them has to make a decision. Mm -hmm. And the book is really about that sort of universal question. If you were in that position, what would you do? Would you... Uh, if it was you and a woman, if you were a man and you were, were locked up with a woman, would you automatically let her kill you? Mm. Or um, if it was you with a, a mother, does the fact that she have children make her, make her life worth more than yours? Um, Can I ask you a question? I know the answer to this because I read the book, but just for people listening to this. Do they, are they allowed to kill to shoot themselves? Uh, yes, uh, if yeah. they should want to. And I think that that's, you know, that's really the question posed, is that you, you would hope that you would do the decent thing and, uh, you know, invite it upon yourself. But I guess what the book's asking is, in that situation, it's so unnatural to ask somebody to kill you mm. that when it absolutely came to the crunch, mm. is there something primal within all of us that would just want to survive mm. and would do something amoral in order to do that? You, how, you, did this, how, did this, well. how did this sick idea come to you? <laughs> Very easily, I would say. 
It, it came to me really because I was just reflecting on how we live now in a, in a competition culture. So because of, you know, the endless lose of, of celebrity magazines, but particularly shows like X Factor and I'm a Celebrity and those sort of shows, we're constantly judging other people. Mm. That's what we do now. We say, you know, who's hottest? Who do we like most? Who do we want to evict from the house? And so I thought, wouldn't it be interesting if a serial killer posed that question but raised the stakes to a matter of life and death? Mm. And so that was really the genesis of the idea. But instead of setting it in the world of celebrity, I obviously couched it in, in the world of sort of ordinary people. And that hopefully made it a sort of more universal question about what's within all of us. Your central character is a, uh, the investigator, is a complex woman with complex needs. Yeah. Uh, she's a masochist, yeah. in effect. And you write very uh, erotically, if you like that kind of thing, and certainly very frankly um, about her visits to a, a dominator, a professional dominator who, who whips her. Yeah. Um, it's very important to the plot, as it, as it turns out. Yeah. Um, again, how did this sick idea come to you? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I wanted to create a um, female protagonist who was just different to anything I'd seen before. Yeah. And that was the key thing for me, because I was sort of looking around. I'd always wanted to write a novel, but I didn't sort of feel I had the tools. I always, because I've always loved the bad, bad guys. Mm. So whether it's reading Silence of the Lambs or Talented Mr. Ripley, I love those characters, mm. the, the Hannibal Lecter and Tom Ripley. But I always found the cops quite boring. Mm. I just thought they were just, you know, it's middle-aged male, blah, 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 blah. Mm. And then I read The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, and for oh. me that was a real eye-opener. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought, OK, wow, finally with Lisbeth Salander you have an investigator who's more interesting than the people she's chasing. Yeah. And that was such a wake-up call for me. And, uh, um, and so from then on, you know, she was sort of haunting my imagination. And, and I think with Helen Grace, you can see the imprint of a lot of that sort of Scandinavian... It is very Scandinavian. It reminded yeah. me a lot of Joe Nesbo in, yeah. in its yeah. sort of an unflinching attitude towards um, really uh, quite unpleasant stuff. But the thing about Helen is, Helen Grace, the cop, she is a very good cop and she's yeah. a very conscientious cop mm. and she has her morals very firmly in the right place. But because of her own past, her own very traumatic family past, she is very... Um, vulnerable. As Richard says, she's masochistic. She can only experience sexual pleasure by being dominated and abused. Um, and we all find out, in the end, we find out precisely why. We also find out that these terrible crimes which she is investigating um, are basically very much linked to her own past. Now, are you going to carry on with her? I mean, you, you're carrying on with, with yeah. even though we now know her past, you don't feel um, that... You don't I'm know all of it. You don't know you, all oh, of it. This, this is I... just the first... No, I, I've... Um, you yeah, know, she, she definitely carries on. I've uh, already finished the second one. and just started the third one. Wow. So wow. Uh, there's going to be at least five, hopefully more. Um, and, uh, yeah, no, I mean, when in an act of, of massive hubris, when, when we first sat down with Penguin, I pitched them the first seven novels, and I said, <laughs> this is how it goes. And the, foolishly, they, they bought it. So, uh, they, so you're, you're writing a franchise, really? Yeah, basically. No, I, I once used the F word, and their eyes lit up. So that was, uh, <laughs> that was, uh, that was very exciting. No, I mean, I, I, I love writing her, and she's, she's great fun to be with. And, uh, and I think I've always, ideas have always been my strong point, and that's sort of, whether it's in TV or, or fiction, I have loads of ideas. So for her, you know, I would love her to, to, to run and run, basically. Right. And I love the way you set it in Southampton. Yeah. Because that is not a place you would ever associate with a thriller. <laughs> no, <laughs> absolutely. No, no, absolutely. But I, I think, you know, Southampton's just... I think any port town is interesting mm -hmm. yeah. because yep. you just get loads of criminality, <laughs> loads of stuff coming in, coming out, yeah. you know, drugs, prostitutes, human trafficking, whatever. And I just think it creates a slightly transient, slightly yeah. uh, unsettling... And seedy. Sort of and seedy. And, yeah. seedy. Yeah. and, of course, yeah. Southampton's interesting because if you go around it, it was so bombed during yes, the war it was, yes. that it just it doesn't really have a centre, it doesn't really have a soul. It's sort of mm. very, very sort of strange place. A very good point. That's a really interesting you know, observation, actually. You're right. It's, whereas, it's, it's still staggering on from the war, isn't it? Absolutely. Whereas yeah. in London, you know, if you're in London, which is obviously vastly much bigger, London still has a centre to me, it has a heart, which I know. I've lived here all, all my life. It was too big to knock out. Basically. Yeah, it's too yeah. big to knock out. But, you know, whereas Southampton, I still can't find it. Yeah. You know, I sort of wander around. And, yeah. uh, and I think, you know, it's, it's not... It, it's sort of similar to a lot of um, modern British towns. It has that occasionally slightly soulless quality to it mm. in parts. And so the second book, a lot of it's set in the red light district. And of course, mm. that's much more exotic than it sounds because in reality, what it is, is an industrial estate that's busy during the day with garages and body shops. It's utterly deserted at night. 
And when you when you go to those places, and I have driven slowly through them just uh, <laughs> for research purposes. <laughs> yes, exactly. And you just think, why on earth would anyone put themselves at risk by doing this? You yeah. know, it's just they must be so desperate because it's so dangerous. No one, yeah. you could be plucked off the street here, and no one yeah, would yeah. know. The yeah. other, I mean, I, I saw the Scandinavian influence um, oh. immediately, um, and you, and it, it it is very strong and very dark. Um, do you also do you like Patricia Cornwell? I, no, I don't know her work very well. Don't you? That's interesting, but I, I will now. It's quite interesting. I will it's, now a, read a, a, it's, it's not. I mean, you know, her, her heroine case, Scarpetta, is a forensic yeah. uh, doctor, um, but uh, there's a similarity there. And again, it's that kind right. of quite right, yeah. quite unflinching approach which she has yeah. to, to to gore. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I must say, your point earlier about Southampton uh, having its soul taken away from it, really, by the German Luftwaffe. That well, it certainly didn't lose its soul, but it lost its city centre. Liverpool is the same. Liverpool was so right. heavily bombed, and we worked yeah. out of Liverpool for many years. And it's, yeah. that's got the same slightly vacant yeah. atmosphere in the centre, hasn't it? Yes. It's not. It doesn't really have, I don't think, a sort of a, a beating well, heart. Well, I think for the when centre. we were there, you're probably right, but I think it's changed now. Very diplomatic. I hope. Yes, exactly. <laughs> otherwise, diplomatic. otherwise you're going to get an awful lot of. Yes, nasty exactly. Noise. No, I love Liverpool. I'm just, I'm, <laughs> I was just saying, I love Liverpool, yeah. but you know, uh, it was heavily, heavily, heavily bombed. Right. Anyway, the book Eeny Meeny by. M J Arledge, M for male, um, <laughs> and I like I like the slug underneath. One lives and one dies, no choice. Available with all the extra content at the back, including the Q and As that we put to the authors um, from W H Smith now, or you can get it on Kobo. Great book, thank you very much. I can't wait to read the next one. Thank you. I love this book. It's kind of right up my street. Vaguely Scandinavian, although it's written by an English guy. Hmm. Uh, it's Scandinavian in that it's so noir, so really <laughs> dark and horrible, and it's a thriller, obviously. Well, as, we put, as we put to the writer in our interview with him, it's sick. I mean, <laughs> actually, the concept is sick, <laughs> the, the basic concept, but it's so gripping. This idea that you're left incarcerated with a gun and one bullet, no food, water, nothing, and eventually you have to face up to the, the choice that he's presented to you. This awful person's presented to you to either be killed or kill. Yeah, only one person from each couple that is abducted can live, mm. can be released from this uh, horrible prison that they're, they're locked into. Um, and that person is the one who makes the decision to kill yep. the other one. Yep. So basically, no matter how much you love each other, and we're talking about a mother and daughter in one of the scenarios, we're talking about... Um, engaged lovers in another and, 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 and various other scenarios. No matter how much you love each other, one of you has to make the decision to sacrifice the other if you want to get out yourself or to do the opposite, to yeah. say that you'll be the sacrificed one. Because to begin with, it's, it's an intellectual conundrum which they don't actually have to act on. But because they're starved uh, and there's no water um, and they are reduced quite quickly in a matter of days, to almost an animal stage. Mm. Suddenly, it's no longer an intellectual question. It really is about the imminence of life or death um, and what that does to people, what that does to human beings. Yeah, and the central character in this book um, is a woman. She's the detective who was uh, charged with investigating... You loved her, didn't you? you thought she was great. Murders. I thought she was amazing. She's quite daunting in some ways because she's had a very, very, very bad past herself, family past, which is intrinsically linked into the, the murders yes. in which she finds herself self-investigating, although she doesn't realise that at the time. Um, but because her own past is so uh, traumatic mm. and something really terrible happened to her when she was young, um, she is a very flawed character in her own right. She's a very good cop, she's full of morality, she's nice, you can't help but like her, but at the same time she's a masochist, uh, she can't take pleasure in anything. She can't certainly can't take any kind of sexual pleasure. And this book is quite sexy, actually. She can't take any kind of sexual pleasure, erotic pleasure, mm. unless she's whipped. Absolutely. Basically. Unless she, unless unless she feels pain through the through, through the pleasure. And she sounds awful, but she's not. She's oh, no, really intriguing, no, no. No, and she's great. very original. I've never read anything like it. And as he says, he's going to bring her back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are yeah. going to be sequels. Yeah. We are going to get to know that. You know, I bet it makes a TV series in the end. Oh, I'm sure it will. Well, it, I mean, I'm sure it will because he's, a, he's also a TV producer. <laughs> I mean, he, I think he already sees it as a, as a major run. But it's very good. It's a very, very, very clever, very original idea. Richard and Judy recommending great books for you, exclusive to WH Smith. I love to spend my time in fictional worlds. Uh, inhabiting 
other people's brains and putting them in uh, challenging and disquieting situations. Well, once you've created characters like D.I. Helen Grace in Eeny Meeny that you fall in love with, it's quite hard not to keep going back to them. Um, there's a little stable of characters now surrounding Helen who I love and who are constantly challenged uh, with new and complex cases as the series develops. And uh, every morning at nine o'clock, I shut myself away and climb back into their world. And it's always sad to have to um, come out of it at the end of the day. Uh, I think every novel is, is, a, is a long haul. It's a sort of cross-country race and halfway through you sort of wonder if you're ever going to get to the end. But basically I completely love it and I think that's partly because I've spent most of my life being a, a TV producer and working with writers and, and not having any of the fun. And so now doing the writing myself, it's so exciting and so thrilling that, uh, that I really love every minute of it. Still to come... Hello, my name is Julie Cohen and I've written Dear Thing. Usually I write instinctively and I try to go on a journey with the characters. With this particular book, because the ending was so crucial, I really had to plan it out. Yeah. I needed to know who ended up with the baby right from the beginning. Right, OK, here we go. I think I'm ready to perform for you, my darling, my love. My first public display of throat singing, but can I just ask a favour, would you accompany me? Oh, always and everywhere, Richard. <laughs> Did you do, or shall I break out my Mongolian mooring core? Oh, I'll take the strings, I think. Uh, and if you're ready, right, here we go. One, two. Uh, one, two, three, four. Hello, sweetie, it's me again. Just to say, keep in touch and tell us what's keeping your pages turning.